Possess my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior, all that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance here by heavy stone, Messiah.
group of people really well. Um, and um, I think another big one for me is just kind of getting stuck in when it feels quite scary, like um, particularly after church coffee for me feels quite scary. Yeah. Um, you don't know who you're going to end up in a, in a small group with. Um, you, will you have anything to talk about with them? You know, you're not quite sure. But actually just going for it, I always feel better having spoken to them or having come to church and met new people or having been around to someone's house or having someone around to ours, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, we've, we've done that and we've always kind of found it a really valuable experience. Yeah. Super. Mate, why don't you just, what would be your one top tip to somebody who's just moved to Cambridge or watching at home and they arrived this week? What would you say would be a good thing to do in their first few weeks here? I think I think small groups are really important, whether that's kind of um, as a kind of like focus for undergrads or hub for 20s and 30s or other small groups available for, for older people. Um, yeah, go along, get involved, say hi to the people who kind of, you know, um, are in your small group or you might get put in, put in one if you're um, on Zoom or whenever we get like, back into the church building, and that kind of thing, say hello. And um, yeah, and just um, just kind of be, make that kind of the one thing to do really well in the week. Super. Yeah, and I think don't be afraid to tell people that you're new as well and to say, you know, hi, we might not have met before and to yeah. just introduce yourself, which can feel a bit scary, but actually is really helpful because um, then people can welcome you better, particularly when they know that you're new. Um, don't be afraid to say, I've forgotten your name. Like, people are friendly. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Well, guys, thank you so much uh, uh, for sharing those thoughts with us. Worth saying, so many people at Stag are new every year. Such a high turnover of folk, and that has its um, upsides and downsides, but it does mean that often we come to church and we think, oh, everyone must know each other. Or you join a small group and you think, oh, all these people know each other, and I'm the new person. It's not the case at all. Um, and do make the most of groups like Hub and Focus, iHub, all the different things. Head to the website. You'll find information there. And why not find the staff member that oversees the area of their work, send them an email and just let them know that you exist and we would love to contact you and let you know all the different things that you could get involved with. Well, we're going to pray for newcomers now. Uh, Matthew um, and his wife are going to pray for us, uh, Rachel, and so I'm going to hand over to them. We're now going to use the wonderful gift that God has given us that we can come to him in prayer. God is our maker, and he is the judge of all. So it's right that we come to him in humility, confessing first that we have not obeyed his commandments and asking for his forgiveness. Let's take a moment to have a look at the words of the prayer of confession, which should come up on the screen and uh, which are also on the service sheet if you downloaded that at home. And then if you're comfortable with it, uh, we'll say it together in a moment. Let's say together, most, most merciful, merciful God, God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ we confess that, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. deed. We, we have not loved you with our, with our whole heart. heart. We, we have, have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In, in your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. The wonderful news of the gospel is that in Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Please hear the prayers that we, your servants, pray before you today. We have confessed that we have acted wickedly towards you. Please remember your promise of redemption for all who believe in the Lord Jesus. And because you are faithful to all your promises, Please grant that we may trust in your salvation and know the joy of sins forgiven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In our prayers this evening, we will be praying for our mission partner, Alice Corns, who is the women's worker at St. Philemon's Church in Toxteth, Liverpool. Her picture should be coming up on the screen. 
Alice works alongside women and children from many different nationalities and beliefs in one of Britain's most deprived communities. Let's continue in prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we lift up to you our sister Alice in Toxteth. Thank you for the enthusiasm you have given her to see others come to know you and for the opportunities you have created for her to get alongside people and to share the gospel with them. She has particularly asked us to pray that you will help her to pray. And so we ask you, Father, please would you help Alice to be earnest and persistent in prayer. Help her, Lord, to delight in spending time with you and to have a steady conviction that unless you do the work, her labour is in vain. Please teach her to depend on you. And as she does so, please would you encourage her greatly with answered prayer and with fruitfulness both in her life and in the lives of the women she works with. Please would you show her how she can best be serving you during this current time of tightened restrictions on socialising in Liverpool. We also pray, Father, for Kathleen Spence, who is planning to return to her work abroad in Bible translation this week. Please keep her in safety and trusting firmly in you to provide for all her needs. Closer to home, we pray for those who have recently arrived in Cambridge or will do so shortly. It's an especially difficult time to be trying to settle in a new city. So we pray that you would be close to each one of them. Please would you help them to get to know others and to make new friends quickly. Please would those who know you be able to settle quickly in a church fellowship. And please would you help us to be welcoming to all and show us how we can be loving in practical ways towards them. We pray especially for students arriving in Cambridge, no doubt with many anxieties and uncertainties. We ask that you would protect against major outbreaks of coronavirus among them, and that they would not be prevented from benefiting from their time here. Please help Christian students to trust in your sovereign care despite the uncertain circumstances. And please give them wisdom and love in supporting and encouraging others. We pray too for the wider coronavirus situation. Please, Father, would you give much wisdom to all our leaders, to the Prime Minister, his Cabinet, the SAGE Committee, local leaders, and all who are involved in making difficult decisions and trying to balance the different risks. Please would you open their eyes to see their own inadequacy and cause them to turn to you for wisdom as your word tells us to. We pray for Christian members of parliament that you would give them courage to speak openly of their trust in you. And we earnestly pray, Father, that there would be no further restrictions imposed on Christians meeting together to worship you and to encourage each other. We thank you that we currently also have the freedom to meet in groups of up to six in our homes. And we pray that you would protect that freedom as well, and that those who are lonely and frustrated will be able to receive the comfort and company that they need. Have mercy on our nation, Lord, and indeed on our whole world. And please would you bring out of this a widespread repentance and returning to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember your promise that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Father, we cry to you that you would fulfill this promise. Lord, let your continual pity cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your aid, protect it by your help and goodness forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
we've been reflecting in our services over the last couple of weeks on what is at the heart of the good news about Jesus, um, that he is the judge of the whole world, and yet is also the one who amazingly brings us peace with God. And our next song helps us marvel at this fact that the Father would love us this much to send his Son for us. going to run through a few notices now. If we haven't met yet, I'm Sarah. I'd love to say hi to you afterwards. And if you're joining us for the first time this evening, as Craig said, you are so, so welcome with us and we'd love to get to know you. So here are a few ways you could do that. If you're here in the building, we're going to say a little something after the service about how we can carry on getting to know each other. Um, if you're not able to be here with us in person, we're really glad that you can join us tonight online. Do head to afterchurchcoffee.com, I promise that's a real thing, um, to join some regular members of the church family and say hi to them afterwards. They'd love to, they'd love to chat. Um, if you'd like some more information about what's going on here at the church family, 
um, or just to let us know you're here, do check out stag.org slash new. Um, if you're a fresher joining us, um, do head to stag.org slash freshers to do the same and to find out some of the stuff that's particularly coming up for undergrads, including, excitingly, freshers' puddings. The, um, for regulars here, the new programme card is now available. Do grab one on your way out. Um, and I've got a notice now about our annual church meeting, the APCM. So newcomers, do bear with me if none of this makes sense to you. Um, the APCM will happen on Wednesday, the 14th of October. The meeting was deferred from last April, and it will be a shortened version of the usual APCM combined with the prayer meeting. And this is our formal opportunity to elect church wardens, members of the church council, and representatives for the deanery synod. Um, regulars, you'll receive an email with an invite to sign up, and there are nomination forms available by the bookstore if you want those. Um, thanks so much for your patience with that. Well, as we've already mentioned this evening, one of the best ways for you to get plugged into um, church family life here is to be part of a small group. Um, small groups are where we meet to study the Bible together, and Hub, our group for 20s and 30s, has already kicked off the last few weeks online, but it's not too late to join in. So do head to stag.org slash new, um, and you'll get the Zoom code if you sign up there. And Focus, our small group for students, will be starting in a few weeks' time, so watch this space. Well, the reason um, we here at SAG want to welcome anyone, whatever background they've come from, is first and foremost because this reflects what God is all about. And we're going to turn now to read a bit of the Bible from Acts chapter 10 and hear more about what God says about who his message is for. And Henry's going to come and read that for us now. The reading this evening is from Acts chapter 10, verse 39 to 11, verse 18. Before we read, let us pray. Our Father, you promise that whenever you send your word out, it will not return empty, but always accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. Please, as we hear your word read and applied, would you accomplish all your purposes in us? In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 10, verse 39. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard, him, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord, nothing impure and unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. 
Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Well, thank you, Henry, very much indeed. Acts chapter 10. That's the chapter which we've been reading together on the last three Sundays. And we've been looking at the very earliest Christian preaching, where we have Peter, who'd been a close friend and was an official spokesman for the Lord Jesus Christ, explaining Christianity to a Roman centurion called Cornelius. And it's been a very helpful reality check for us. Are we getting our understanding and presentation of the Christian message right? I think one of the great problems in the churches uh, in our day is a confusion about exactly what Christianity is. What is the message which we have? Well, where better to go than right back to the original? And that's what we've been doing, rather like looking at uh, an old master picture that's got all grimy, and we've cleaned it to see uh, clearly uh, what it originally looked like. We're going back to the earliest Christian preaching to see what the message, the real, authentic Christian message was. And as we listened to Peter in Acts chapter 10 last week, we saw that it was all about Jesus. Seems obvious, but the Christian message isn't Uh, simply a system of ethics or a philosophy for life, something like that. It's about a person, Jesus Christ, a real historical figure. Peter tells us that he is Lord of all. And he goes on to say he will be the judge of all people. I must admit, when I got to that bit, I was thinking, I wonder if that's Uh, the way that we often present Christianity now. Is that the place we would start talking about Jesus? But Peter starts there. He's a real historical person, he's Lord of all, and he will be the judge of all people. But, Peter went on, anyone who comes to him will be forgiven. And we saw how this links to the resurrection, which shows that Jesus is not dead, but will one day come back and judge, but also to the cross, where Jesus hung and bled and died, absorbing the punishment that we deserve so that anyone who comes to him might be freely forgiven. So this chapter that we've been looking at is enormously valuable as a kind of reality check for us as a church. And we need to heed it. And we need to listen to the way that it reminds us of original Christianity. But there's more to Acts chapter 10 even than that. Because what we go on to see in the section we get to tonight is not so much the message that was preached as what happened as a result of that. And it's no exaggeration to say that what happened as a result of this message being preached here in Acts chapter 10 is monumentally significant. It's arguably one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. And we're going to see why. We pick up at verse 44 of chapter 10 on the Church Bibles, page 1105. I don't know what page it's on in your Bible at home. We pick up with what happened next. Peter's been preaching, and I suppose like everybody who's sharing the good news of Christianity, he's kind of inwardly wondering how this is going to go, what sort of reception this message is going to get, how people are going to respond. He's called for a response. He said that everyone who believes in Jesus will find in him the forgiveness of sins. What's going to happen? Well, he doesn't have to wait very long for the answer. In fact, 
Even while he's speaking, verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And that means that God had accepted Cornelius and his household. I need to explain. The Holy Spirit is God himself. God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that the risen Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be with all his people, to come and dwell inside them. It's quite a hard thing for us to get our minds around, but the Bible actually tells us that God, God's Spirit comes to dwell inside all who he's brought to know him. It is the most wonderful fact of Christian experience. Actually, it's the Holy Spirit's arrival in a person's life which explains the, the kind of eye-opening way that you begin to understand Christianity for the first time, particularly um, at, at, at that moment if you've been inquiring and then the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you desire to serve Jesus as Lord and to please him and a lot more. This comes from God coming into us by his Holy Spirit. In fact, at root... A real Christian is not just someone who believes certain things, although a real Christian does believe certain things about Jesus. A real Christian is somebody who has the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in them. That's why in the end a person either is a Christian or is not a Christian. You can't have degrees of being Christian. You either have the Spirit living in you or you don't, and every real Christian has the Holy Spirit living in them. It's, it's a bit cheesy to put it like this, but it's a matter of new life, not new leaf. When you become a Christian, you're not just turning over a new leaf. You're being given a new life from God. And conversion is more than just a change of mind. It is a change of mind. But at a deeper level, it's the Holy Spirit coming to live inside you. And that's what happened to Cornelius and all the household that he had gathered with him because he had a whole crowd of people with him to listen to Peter. It happened just in the ordinary course of Peter explaining the Christian message. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. That's one of the wonderful things. Just the ordinary business of explaining the basic Christian message is the way that God uses to bring his Holy Spirit into people's lives. And looking around the room in here, I can see people whose stories I know of how they first had the Holy Spirit come to live in them as a result of perhaps a friend explaining to them the Christian good news. Now, although we do the explaining, the giving of the Spirit can only come from God himself. So nothing could be a clearer indication that Cornelius had been accepted by God to become one of his children. It must have been the most wonderful news for him. Reading back through this, this series which we've had over the last three Sundays, we've learned that Cornelius was a man who seemed to be seeking God in some way. Perhaps God had stirred him up to seek him. He was a God-fearer. He, he wanted to do the right thing by God. And uh, prompted by God, he sent to Peter uh, messengers to, 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 for Peter to come back and explain the Christian message to him. And now he's found what he was looking for. Now he's accepted by God. And he has the experience of the Holy Spirit living in him. The most wonderful news for him. And so Peter said, verse 46, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptised with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. So um, they found some water and Cornelius and co. were baptised. It's one of the great joys we have here at uh, St. Andrew the Great is behind me there is the baptistry and from time to time we can't do it at the moment because of the COVID but uh, we have the privilege of baptism and that's what happened to Cornelius but did you notice something unusual about what happened as the spirit came on Cornelius and his friends verse 45 uh, the circumcised believers, that is the Jewish Christians who come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. The gift of the Spirit was marked out by 
Cornelius and Co. speaking in tongues. In the book of Acts, that is a supernatural, God-given ability to speak other languages. It had happened once before in, uh, on the day of Pentecost when Peter and the uh, early disciples were given this gift of tongues and could speak to a crowd of uh, Jewish people who'd come from different parts of the world on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, each hearing in their own language. Absolutely amazing. You and I acquire language facilities by years of awful, painful, modern languages uh, teaching. I mean, to get the gift of tongues is the MML student's absolute dream. Uh, no coaching required. It's a supernatural gift from God. And it's unusual here because there are lots of people who are converted to Christianity in the book of Acts, but only occasionally does the gift of tongues come with it. It comes once more in the book of Acts only, uh, which is with some people who hear about the Holy Spirit in the city of Ephesus. Lots of other people get converted. There's no sign of this gift. And indeed, in his letter to, first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul makes clear, he talks about this gift, and he makes clear that not everybody, uh, even Christians, have this gift. So what's going on? What's the significance? Why does God give this particular gift in this way at this time? It seems that God wanted to flag up publicly for the world to see that Cornelius and his friends had been given his spirit. You see, you can't see the Holy Spirit coming into a person. This is an invisible work of God. Oh yes, you can see it in our lives long term. The Lord Jesus said rather like you, can, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind blowing the trees. But you couldn't have seen it then and there at that moment when Peter was preaching. So on this occasion, God gave a visible marker, a sign. Some of you scientists understand about things like fluorescent dye to mark things out. Or another illustration I was thinking of was <clears throat> sometimes uh, you hear of somebody who writes somebody an open letter. I think Boris Johnson get lots, gets lots of people writing open letters. You could write a private letter to the Prime Minister. But you might want to write an open letter which also goes to the uh, newspaper and out on social media because you want the world to hear what you've said. Well, God is sending a kind of open letter to the world by giving this gift to Cornelius, saying to the world, I have given him and his fellow uh, household my Holy Spirit, and I want all of you to know it visibly and publicly. Because God has a very big point he wants the world to hear, which is this. The good news of Jesus is for everyone, Gentiles as well as Jews. See, that's the background. Cornelius, who's the guy who is listening to Peter, this centurion, is not Jewish. He's a Gentile. You remember, Gentiles are all the people in the world who are not Jewish. Everybody in this room is either Jewish or Gentile. He had not grown up with the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. He didn't have any of, their, any of the ethnic inheritance. He didn't share their customs, their food laws, their faith. Or, most importantly, the unique relationship that that nation had with God. Up to this point in history, God had had a special dealing with those people. That's the story of the Old Testament. He wanted the world to see how good it is when a people have God as their God, and he did it through this one nation from Abraham onwards. And indeed, he prepared the world through that nation to receive the gift of his son who came in the first instance to them, to Judea. The earliest Christian preaching was to Jewish people. If you read this book of Acts, which is the story of the first decades of the Christian church's expansion, the first few chapters are all preaching Christ to Jewish people. All the action is in Jerusalem. All the converts are Jewish converts to Christianity. But now, there is a huge turning point in the history of the world, not just even the book of Acts, as Gentiles become Christians. That's the punchline, and it comes again and again in this passage. The circumcised believers, verse 45, who'd come with Peter, 
were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. That's the point. The good news of Jesus is for everyone, and God wanted the world to know that. From this point on, in the book of Acts, we see the Christian message reaching out to many Gentiles. The very next chapter, we're introduced to a church at a place called Antioch. It's not in Judea. It's in the southeastern part of what now we will call Turkey. And it's a church with an international membership. Chapter 13, verse 1. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, he came from Cyprus. He was Jewish. Simeon called uh, uh, Niger, which means he was a, a black uh, a man. Lucius of Cyrene, which is also in Africa. Manan, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. He was posh. And Saul, who was Jewish but didn't live in Judea. It was an international fellowship. And then when you turn over the pages of the New Testament beyond the book of Acts, you discover more and more of this international fellowship. There's a the first thing after the book of Acts is a, is a letter written to the church in Rome. The one after that, Corinth in modern Greece. Uh, and then Galatia in modern Turkey, Ephesus, western part of modern Turkey, uh, Philippi in Macedonia, Colossae in, in western Turkey, and so it goes on. And from that point on, you have the development of the phenomenon we now have of Christians all over the world. When I first became a Christian, I found this the most, uh, one of the most wonderful discoveries, to discover I joined an international family. I went, um, I became a Christian as an undergraduate here in Cambridge. I then went to do uh, graduate studies in the States and uh, met up with lots of international students uh, there. Um, and um, a few of us got together one evening to try and put on an event. Um, we, we, were, we, were, we wanted to flag up to our fellow international students that uh, Christianity wasn't just for uh, Americans. Uh, because there were lots of big churches in the town we lived in. It was a global thing. So I got my friend uh, Raichi, who is from Japan, and Julio, who's from Peru, and Victor, who's from India, myself, as uh, from the UK. Here are four of us. None of us are American. We're all Christians. We come from very different cultures. We tried putting on an evening event. Actually, it was a total flop. I don't know if it was the food or what it was, but we had a go. And I remember those friends very fondly, and I remember the, the fellowship with which we had at between us across the nations. Maybe you can try something like that here and do better than I did. We were all so glad of Jesus. Actually, the very supernatural gift that God gave of the gift of tongues itself flags up the international nature of the gospel, doesn't it? What miracle could more show God's intent to reach the world and the nations for Christ? Here's the message. The good news of Jesus is for everyone Gentiles as well as Jews. And of course, it follows the facts about Jesus. Just go back over what, Jesus, uh, what Peter said about Jesus. If you have a look at um, uh, verse uh, 36, he says, You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. A carpenter from Nazareth is Lord of all. Through him, we learn, the whole uh, world was made. Yeah, I think a lot of people still think that here in church, we're kind of a minority special interest. You know, there are people who like playing the bagpipes. There are people who like collecting stamps. And there are people who like going to church. They're all just little minority things that people do. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, says Peter. Uh, the gods of the ancient world uh, used to be tied to particular localities. So Artemis was the big goddess for, effort for the city of Ephesus, and different cities had different gods. But Jesus was different from that. He broke all the boundaries. He's Lord of all. And then Peter goes on. He says, verse 42, He, that is Jesus, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he's the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Living and the dead... That is all people. Everybody in this room is either living or dead. I presume most of you are living. So, uh, but everybody who's ever lived. 
is living or dead. It's, it's universal language again. The Lord Jesus is the judge of all. We will all, all humans will meet him on the last day. And then the universal language in verse 43, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Only the judge can forgive. Only the judge can let you off the charge. And here is the judge, as we saw last week, most amazingly, who bore the penalty himself that those who trust in him might be freely forgiven. And everyone, whoever you are, whatever your background, who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Pagans, Jews, atheists, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Confucians, Zoroastrians, anything you like, agnostics, rich or poor, one Lord and Saviour, Jesus. Uh, there was this great conference, wasn't there, off, uh, in the, the closing months of the Second World War, where Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin met at Yalta in the Crimea to kind of sort of parcel out different bits of Europe uh, for, for the post-war settlement. You can have this bit, you can have this bit. Sometimes we think of, uh, it's easy to slip into thinking of the world a bit like that. You know, the uh, mu Muslim people can have the 1040 window and uh, the uh, East Asia belongs to Confucianism and Buddhism, South Asia to Hinduism and so forth, and maybe a bit of Christianity in Europe. But it was never like that in the beginning. It's one world with one Lord, one judge, one savior. And that means that whoever you are, Whatever your background, you can come to Jesus for forgiveness. So there's a huge turning point here in the book of Acts. As this great point is established, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ is for everyone, Jew or Gentile. And what happens next in the book of Acts is a very good clue to the implication of this. Because it's, we don't have long to wait if we read through this book before we find journeys beginning. Paul, who's been converted, and his friend Barnabas set out from this uh, wonderful church in Antioch to uh, Cyprus and then on to Turkey uh, with, the, uh, with the good news. And then, in fact, there are three more journeys narrated in the book. Journeys to new places, foreign capitals and cities, preaching the gospel of Jesus, not just to Jewish people, but to Gentile people, and leaving behind a trail of churches which have been planted. After this turning point, the great agenda for the church is to reach the world for Jesus. Just this week, we say goodbye as a church family to um, our dear friend, uh, Kathleen Spence. Kathleen is a Bible translator in West Africa, and she's uh, been a member of this church for a long time. It's been lovely having her back in Cambridge for a bit. Uh, do pray for her. She heads back. What motivates her to go and do that work? Bringing the word of God to people who don't have it in their own language and to use her considerable gifts in this very hard labor. It's because she knows there is one Lord, one judge, one savior, and she wants everybody to hear about him. And she wants to play her part in making that good news accessible to those who presently don't have it. But actually, this is something that all of us need to take on board. We really, really do. What's our part in this great global initiative which follows the fact that Jesus, uh, the good news about Jesus is for everybody? You know, some uh, books of the Bible, some chapters, uh, you... you, you, you uh, it, it can take a while before, in my um, understanding, the penny drops a bit about what's going on. But in this chapter, uh, the teaching is as plain as the nose on your face. Well, that's a poor expression because I can't see any noses at the moment. But uh, it's, very, it's very, very clear. You can't miss it. God makes the point with tremendous emphasis. He sends an angel to Cornelius to say, go and send for Peter. He sends a vision to Peter of a sheep coming down from heaven saying, don't call this food unclean, you should eat it. By implication, you should be willing to fraternize with the Gentiles. He gets Peter and Cornelius together. 
Peter starts to speak, and even while Peter's speaking, the Holy Spirit comes on Cornelius. There's this public, visible sign of the tongues. And then in chapter 11, as Henry was reading to us, um, the Jerusalem Christians, sort of headquarters, have a bit of an inquiry. What's going on with the gospel reaching out to all these uh, unwashed Gentiles? And Peter goes to them, and he retells the story, and he says at the end, or the, the, the conclusion that the, the, they have at the end, verse 18 of chapter 11, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then even to Gentiles God has granted repentance that leads to life. You can't miss the message. And it made me think, well, if God is that emphatic about it, we need to absorb it. Maybe we're a bit like Peter and take a bit of persuading. I was thinking of Cornelius. I was thinking why I might have been reluctant to speak to him about Jesus. To Peter, as um, a, a Jewish person with his customs carefully guarded, Cornelius was somebody he shouldn't really mix with. He might have to eat the wrong kind of food and that kind of thing. And I was thinking, well, what are the barriers in, in my uh, mind uh, what are the things which are stopping me from mixing with people who might be a bit different from me? They might be people that I feel I disapprove of, or just different. They might be different ethnically, they might be different personality-wise, socially, in all kinds of ways. And it's a reminder to me, and it should be a reminder to you if you're a Christian tonight, that we need to be prepared to cross barriers and uh, talk to people who are different from us about the Lord Jesus Christ. Incidentally, God's given us a brilliant way to practice that. It's called church. He puts different sorts of people together. So interesting that the church in Antioch, this multiracial church, was the engine for international mission. I guess people have got used to speaking to people, getting to know people who are different from them, and uh, that helped them get a world vision and helped them to know how to speak for Christ. Don't be cliquey in your friendships here. Get to know people at church who are different from you. And it will be a help to you in talking to non-Christians who are different from you. Arts and science, even. You know, when you're talking to a scientist, you don't have to assume they're always just going to talk about potassium permanganate, things you don't understand. You can talk to them and get to know them as people. Scientists get to know the arts people. Uh, people with academic jobs, non-academics, different races, and so on. Another reason I might have been tempted not to speak to Cornelius was because he was a good guy. He's described to us as a God-fearer. He said his prayers. And I might have thought to myself, he doesn't need Jesus. He's okay as he is. It's very interesting what um, Peter says um, in chapter 11, verse uh, 13. Uh, he told us how he'd seen an angel, this is Cornelius had told us how he'd seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. He still needed to be saved. Good man though he was, he was still a sinner who fell short of the glory of God, as all humans do. He still needed to know the good news of forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's easy to look at people we regard as, 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 as good or perhaps devout followers of another religion, the devout Muslim, the devout Hindu, the sincere and kind agnostic. They, as we do, all need to be saved by Jesus. So there's the big message. The gospel is for all people, Jew and Gentile. And by implication, were we be involved in the sharing of this gospel with all people. A final thought, a final thought just to encourage us. God really wants us to get this message out. And it's no surprise that in this chapter we see that he helps his people. He prepares people to hear. He prepared Cornelius. Now, he may not prepare people nowadays by an angel, but you will discover, I discover, although I'm, I'm feeble sometimes at speaking to people about uh, trusting in Christ, I still discover when I do sometimes that it seems if God has already prepared somebody for that conversation. I had that kind of conversation just a week or two ago. Very struck as I started speaking to somebody about, the, about uh, uh, Christ. How he said, he, funnily enough, he just started thinking about all that just recently. 
So I know that I should pray for that and I can speak knowing that God is preparing people. And also knowing that we're not alone. God gives his Holy Spirit and it's through the explaining of the message that he's given us that he can change people. Shall we pray together? We thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of having your spirit. We thank you for showing us so forcefully that the good news of Jesus is for the whole world. Please help each of us to heed this message. Please be preparing us to speak to people and be preparing people for us to speak to about Jesus. Amen. Well, as we've just heard, whoever we are, we can rejoice that Jesus is Lord and he can be our saviour as well. But also, whatever week we've had, whether we have been joyful, whether we've been weeping, whether we've been struggling, uh, we can and should still rejoice that Jesus is Lord. And that's what we're going to sing in our final song now. us uh, to the end of our service together. Um, just a few things to say before we head off. Uh, for you guys at home, I'm really sorry for the sound issues at the start. Uh, the interview, I think you missed all of that, but everyone around here was mouthing to me. It was one of the best interviews they've ever heard. So maybe we'll do the same again next week and hopefully uh, we won't have those problems again. Sorry about that. 
Uh, if you are at home, uh, make up for that technical difficulty and join after church coffee and have a chat with some people there, especially with your new. Uh, remember all the things mentioned in the notices. Do let us know you're here. We'd love to welcome you properly. Uh, for those of us that are here, it's Chris Wiles' last service. Give us a wave, Chris. This is no good for you guys at home. Chris's last service. Maybe you know Chris. Send him a message. Go say goodbye. Chris is heading off to Bristol, and I'll let you uh, ask him about all of that. Well, I'm going to pray for us, and then we can head on our way. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that your gospel is good news, that your son is Lord of all. He will judge, but he's also offered salvation to all. And we thank you that whoever we are, whatever our background is, whatever our experience of church is, whatever our lives have looked like up until this day, salvation can be found in Jesus. Help us all this week to think seriously about that, to respond well to that, and help us not to be reluctant people when we think of sharing the gospel with others. Father, pray that none of us would think that we don't need your son. Pray that all of us would see what a joy it is to have salvation in him. Amen.